Greetings. This lecture is on strategic human resource management, specifically how the HR function needs to work in alignment with the corporate strategy. Um, every business has its own strategy, its own mission and vision and plan for how it wants to engage in its activities, and the human resource management function needs to make sure its activities support the corporate strategy of the business. So what we'll cover in this course is reviewing in this particular module is reviewing um, what corporate strategies are, how HR relates to that, um, specifically different ways that HR um, can develop its own strategies and think about that in the context of the different ways that businesses compete, whether they compete on price or they compete on innovation. Um, HR has to adapt given that. So um, we'll talk uh, quite a bit about understanding corporate strategy and all that alignment uh, work. So we'll move on to the first uh, substantive slide which is asking the question, what is strategic HRM? Strategic HR is basically how the HR department, or really any other department um, in the company, aligns their people issues with, um, with the strategy and the um, uh, mission and direction of the company. Um, and every department, whether they're marketing or finance or accounting or HR, all are responsible for working towards um, aligning their activities with the mission and the vision and the strategy of the companies. Um, HR specifically um, has to make sure that they are focusing on all of the people issues in all the departments um, to make sure that these issues are in connection and in alignment with, um, you know, the direction that the company is going in. And we'll talk about how that actually looks in, in a bit. Um, there's a couple of different approaches to strategic HR. There is some um, belief that there is a one, you know, one-size-fits-all best practices approach, um, that there are certain things that work best, you know, for a company. And... While this list of things that you see on this first slide look really good, you know, self-managed teams, selective hiring, employment security, we have to also recognize that um, that doesn't work in all organizations. For example, comparatively high compensation contingent on org performance. Apple, of course, will pay comparatively high compensation. McDonald's does not. Does does that mean that McDonald's is a uh, uh, poor employer, that they don't do a good job, that they're not maximizing the use of their HR to, um, you know, to meet their advantage? What is McDonald's competitive advantage? It's the consistency of their products, whether or not you like McDonald's or, you know, Big Macs, but it's the consistency of their products at a reasonable price anywhere you go. So they compete not on innovation, not on quality, but they compete on price and consistency of delivery. <clears throat> so just because they can't pay high price doesn't mean that they're not a successful company achieving what it sets out to achieve based on its mission and its vision. Selective hiring, same idea. Do we need selective hiring for, um, you know, a fry cook at McDonald's or a clerk at or a clerk at Walmart, as opposed to a uh, research scientist at Apple or IBM. Of course, given the mission and vision of IBM or Apple, as compared to Walmart or McDonald's, you know, selective hiring makes no sense. Now, are there are a few of these items that I think are really important and I think are, are consistent and uniform across the board. For example, extensive training. Absolutely. Um, any company that is engaged in uh, using their employees for their competitive advantage, um, particularly even McDonald's or Walmart. I mean, if you want to compete based on low costs, you've got to train your employees how to minimize those costs um, so that you can um, sell things at a lower price to the end, end user. So extensive training makes sense no matter what your company strategy is. Um, sharing of financials and performance information. Uh, employees are not stupid. Employees understand numbers 
if given to them in a way that is accessible. So, um, and I've got some, you know, multitudes of examples of working with small businesses and companies that said, you know, we share our numbers with our employees. They understand what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, and therefore, we, um, we find that we have uh, an improved buy-in to the bottom line of the company. So if we can share our financials, if the people know how well the company is doing, there's less argument about, you know, uh, lack of transparency and, come, you know, top management hiding things. I mean, we're clear where the money is going and we know how well we're doing and we know how much harder we need to work in order to achieve our goals. So you could probably go through this whole list and figure out some of these things that work and make sense and some of these things that that don't make sense in a uniform way and certainly um, you know you know not every company and not every position it doesn't make sense to have a self-managed team um, or decentralized decision making you know those sorts of things so um, the point that I'm making here is this best practices approach can be debunked pretty quickly and pretty easily that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to HR strategic HR really relies upon the it depends approach. Um, our best practices are contingent upon the company strategy, the culture within that company, and then all sorts of constraints that are out there. We need to be aware of, as we scan our environment, we need to be aware of geographic issues and how they differ from place to place, um, and also geographic culture, you know, in the south versus the midwest versus the coasts. Uh, we need to know what sort of availability there is in terms of uh, skills and abilities in the labor force, what's going on in the economy, what kind of regulations are out there that we face. And all of these are important factors that we need to stay on top of to ensure that um, we're adapting our HR strategy to continue to meet the company strategy and we have to take all these things into account. So you can see how managing people, not only are you managing a resource that has its own mind and was going to do what it wants to do in many respects if left to its own devices, um, you also have to manage them within the context of all these different constraints and contingencies um, and you can see how managing people is probably one of the messiest things you will do in your life. So on this slide, we're going to compare and contrast traditional HR versus strategic HR. You get a good sense of how strategic HR has changed over time. Traditionally, the HR function had a very narrow skill uh, application, very micro approach to things. Um, you know, they were focused on short term, uh, low risk planning. You know, they mostly focused on head counts and, and costs and things like that. Um, what we're seeing much more now in the HR department is a more strategic perspective that we see employees as contributors to the bottom line of the company that they certainly can give us a competitive advantage um, as we are working we have a much more long-term approach to things um, much more adaptive and innovative practices that we're engaged in and it's really essential that the HR department in managing people have a good sense of business acumen and they understand you know, change management and development of the organization and the com and the employees within it. So, um, you know, our focus much more so now in the HR arena is more on the strategic side of things. So strategic management, um, obviously we are focusing on, um, you know, understanding um, what is the mission and the vision and the direction that the company is going in. In essence, organization strategy is, you know, what we want to do and how we want to do it. Um, so our mission is in a very broad sense how we define ourselves. <clears throat> the goals are what the organization wants to achieve and the strategic plan is, you know, how it's going to achieve those goals. The link below is from Southwest Airlines and on the PowerPoint slide you can click on that hot link in play mode and go to their website where they talk about their mission and vision. So every company comes up with a mission, goal, and strategic plan for themselves and then that filters down through the organization. So strategic planning has to filter down from the top where the top management team has decided what the mission and vision and things are supposed to look like and then it filters all the way down to the basic functions in each department in each division 
So how does this basically work? Well, we start at the, the corporate level, and at that corporate level, the organization has to decide the portfolio of businesses that it wants to be in. Sometimes they like to have a very consistent portfolio where things are all within the same industry, within their level of corporate competence, and then other corporations like to diversify their portfolio. So they have some parts of their business that, for example, the old Philip Morris, um, which is now... Um, uh, Altria. Um, before they became Altria, they were known as Philip Morris, and Philip Morris was broken down into their Kraft General Foods division, which dealt with food and Oscar Mayer bologna and hot dogs, and then and the other division was cigarettes. So even within the cigarettes, they had a domestic market and they had an international market. So they had a very diversified portfolio. Um, in the slideshow, if you click on the Cisco Systems link in the slideshow that's on, um, uh, it's in Blackboard, you can go to the um, website where Cisco talks about the way that they grow. They grow very consistent to their core mission, which is about um, connectivity and switches and ways to network people together. And they are unique in that they acquire businesses in order to grow. They typically don't get involved in too much R&D and develop from within. Cisco um, acquires through external um, growth and they acquire other businesses and you can see on their website um, if you go click on that you'll see an enormous number of acquisitions that they make annually and this goes back for decades um, that's part of their uh, core uniqueness their their core strategy um, they grow by acquisition um, on the next slide you'll see Boeing um, I won't get into talking about Boeing, but the slide is a really good illustration of a company that has two different divisions that are also fairly similar, but they're structured in a very different way from Cisco because Boeing grows internally. They don't grow by acquisition. So we'll move on to the next thing, the business level strategy or the divisional strategy. It's how then we, were, we would, for example, look at Cisco. And for Cisco, you know, they have all those different acquisitions, and each of these acquisition groups um, have their own business level or division level strategy, and it's going to be a little bit different than the one next to them or the one to the right of them, but all of those businesses that they acquire all have to work towards the overall corporate level strategy, whatever it is. Each one plays their own role, each one has their own set of goals that they're trying to set based on the, 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 the frame of reference that they're working within, you know, what their, their core competencies are, but each of those divisions has their own, um, their own way of doing it, but it all has to work towards the corporate level strategy. I mean, if you go back to Altria or to what was Philip Morris, what is, used to be Philip Morris, um, Again, Kraft General Foods and Oscar Mayer Hot Dogs was a very different strategy than um, uh, the cigarette division. And even the international cigarette division is very different than the domestic division. So those are all unique business level or division level strategies. From there, we go down to the functional level strategy, which is at the department level. Each department in the company within those business divisions are all responsible for making sure that the overall mission, and vision, and goals of the company are communicated to the employees at the grassroots level, what they have to do, when they have to do it, and why they have to do it. Um, so they have to be in alignment. So again, if you think about it this way, if HR's job is to hire people and to pay people well and to give them performance appraisals and reward systems, then if our company has got a strategy where we're growing in leaps and bounds, then of course we're going to use very different HR tactics than we would if we we're a company that's struggling financially and we're actually thinking about doing layoffs. So it, it'll vary in that way. So um, each, each division, each department within those divisions, each department, marketing department, accounting, and, you know, operations, they all have their own unique strategies, but they have to be in alignment with what the overall goal is for the company. Um, and if those things aren't in alignment, then the company is going to be flailing. They're not going to be all heading in the right direction, and we want the company to all head in the right direction. 
so very quickly, this is a great example of, again, the difference between corporate strategy and departmental or divisional strategy. Boeing, as a corporation, has a corporate strategy, but it has two separate divisions. It has a commercial airlines division, it has a defense and space and security division, and both of those have very different markets, very different rules governing them. Um, the HR is going to be different because in the defense and space and security area, there's a lot more background checks that have to be done and security clearance that has to be dealt with. And so they have these corporate functions that are, of course, specified to their each of those divisions um, that deal with government relations and engineering and strategy and HR and what have you. But the bottom line is they're two separate divisions, but they have all these, uh, the, those things on the right-hand side, those corporate functions are those functional or departmental, um, the functional level strategies that support the divisions, and those divisions support the overall corporate strategy. We're moving on to strategy typologies. Um, and the next three slides are a couple of different ways to think about uh, strategy uh, at the corporate level, particularly the direction that the company is going into or the way that they want to differentiate themselves in the market and the method by which they're going to compete in the marketplace. Gluck is looking at just sort of um, overall uh, strategies in terms of growth, stability, and retrenchment. Now growth can be either internal or external. Um, internal growth is actually through internal development, through R&D, those sorts of things where we do our own innovations and we grow and develop them and then we sell them. And that's like an Apple, it's like an IBM, it's like a Microsoft, it's larger, you know, more innovative companies. Um, external growth companies are like Cisco systems where they grow through mergers, through joint ventures. They understand that they don't have the expertise in-house, they don't want to develop that expertise in-house, so they acquire businesses that help them to grow. Stability strategies um, are when we're not in a position where we can grow. It may be because the market is stable or flat. Um, we might have a poor economic conditions where growth is not an option right now, but we're also fairly stable financially and we want to maintain stability so that when the market goes up, obviously we can continue to grow. So, it's, um, Or we may be a company that's very mature in our business, so we're not in a place where there's lots of innovation, but we want to maximize our profitability by minimizing and stabilizing our expenses. So the stability strategy, if you think about it this way, we know that um, uh, you know, profits equals uh, revenues minus expenses. What we're doing in a stability strategy is not necessarily growing revenues as much as we are maintaining expenses and decreasing expenses to improve our profit margin that way. Retrenchment strategy is those companies that are um, not necessarily in trouble, although many may be, but they, do, they choose to reduce the scale of their operations. Now, a company may find that they're um, flattening in terms of profits and growth, and they may decide to sell off divisions of their business that are not profitable, or they may, t may choose to decrease the, um, the size of their business because it's gotten too cumbersome, or they may just decide to divide it off into separate businesses entirely, um, and so spin things off in very different ways. So um, retrenchment may be that the company is in financial problems, but the goal here is not that they're in in a increasing growth mode, but that they're in a decreasing mode to to shrink the size of that business um, in order to again have an impact on the bottom line uh, of the company. The next two slides are dealing with Porter and with Miles and Snow, who are looking at more how the company differentiates itself in the marketplace. Um, are they going to compete based on price? Are they going to compete based on innovation? Those sorts of things. Um, Porter, fairly straightforward. Two major ways that they can differentiate themselves is through what we call the differentiation strategy or the cost leadership strategy. Uh, differentiation, obviously we're going to improve profitability and differentiate ourselves in the market through innovation quality and customer service, high end. And when we are charging, when we are um, being very innovative and high quality and offering really good customer service, we can charge more money for our products and services. And additionally, we can pay more money to our employees because we're expecting top-notch quality um, 
uh, experience and KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities from those employees in order to achieve the innovation quality and customer service that we want to give to our employees. From a cost leadership perspective, what we're doing is we're making, we're maintaining profitability through cutting costs and being efficient, and we're competing based on price. So our goal here is volume sales. We want to uh, make sure that we're competing in a way that has, that we're pricing our products in a way that makes people want to buy them. Um, so we're bringing the prices down, but that means B, that A, that we don't um, get to pay our employees top dollar, and that B, our focus is on um, man maintaining and managing our expenses and our costs, so we keep those as suppressed as possible. So tight controls over money and expenses are really important. We're not frivolous. Um, we don't do a lot of excess um, in terms of uh, the cost, uh, you know, there's a little extra bonuses that don't tend to come into play when you're a cost leadership company. And we look at like a Walmart or a, a McDonald's, they tend to compete on price. And so, you know, employees aren't paid well, there's lots and lots of extra perks, um, you know, they, they just keep it fairly bare bones in order to manage that. And their accounting function is fairly strong there because the accounting function is about managing those, those costs as, as much as possible. Now, uh, there is a third type called the focus strategy, and focus strategy is really a very small niche market. Um, it's not large or global. It's, it's uh, more focused on a particular small area. Um, you can either have a differentiation focus strategy or a cost leadership focus strategy. Um, it's when we're dealing with a small local um, you know, market as opposed to a more global market, um, you know, where we're thinking about um, a particular small market that's never been tapped into before. And for example, um, you, know, you know, if you go back 20 years, you know, the organic food market was considered a niche focus differentiation strategy where we're looking at the quality of product or service. Uh, the cost for organic foods was through the roof um, because it was a small group of people who are only interested in paying top dollar for a certain quality of food. Um, and as major corporations um, sort of bought into this idea that there's an organic market and a huge growing profit area, it went from a focus strategy to a small elite sort of group of people to one that is more across the board where, you know, more people and more people in the mainstream are willing and able and, and want to buy, um, you know, organic foods. So um, if um, the market grows big enough in a focus strategy, it becomes more of the, it loses its focus and becomes more mainstream and becomes differentiation or cost leadership. Moving down to Miles and Snow, Miles and Snow emulates Porter. I mean, they're, they, they, they have their own niche. The prospectors are the same, relatively speaking, to the differentiation strategy of Porter. The defenders are the cost leadership. Uh, uh, company, um, you know, where they, they compete based on price and keeping the costs low. How do they differ from Porter in that is that um, they have analyzers. Analyzers recognize that, you know, when you have your portfolio of businesses, you may have one part of your business that's focused on innovation um, and like a prospector, and another part of your business may be a defender where you're competing on low cost. So within your corporate strategy, you've got a part of you that may be a differentiation strategy company and the other one's a cost leadership strategy. And one example that I can give you is Isaac Mizrahi. Now, Isaac Mizrahi, if you don't know, um, is a high-end couture designer um, in terms of clothes and things like that. And Isaac Mizrahi not only has a high-end market that he sells, you know, where outfits are thousands upon thousands of dollars that he sells to high-end clients, but he also has a market where he sells to Target. So he understands that, you know, he's got one area where he can innovate and, you know, and, and charge top dollar, and then he's got another market where he's focused on cost um, uh, price points and focuses on the price points for his, tar his market through Target department stores. Um, and so within your business, you can have different products or services or product lines um, that are, um, that may be focused either in innovation um, and quality and things like that, or cost leadership. The last area of Miles and Snow is this idea of this dysfunctional strategy, 
and where it's really a non-strategy. Reactors are people who react to situations. Strategy by definition means we're planning in advance. Reactors don't plan in advance. They simply react um, to the environment and you know like chicken little with the head cut off um, and they don't really focus on um, you know what they can do in a proactive way. So they are considered a dysfunctional strategy um, but technically speaking they're not really strategies because they're not planning in advance, they're simply reacting. So moving on to the next slide, um, the HR action plan. And you know, we you know, the question that you know came up was, you know, how do the HR activities differ given the strategy of the business? Um, and how does this sort of filter down? And the example that I'm giving here is um, the Gluck strategy, and you could do this with Miles and Snow, you can do all the you can do this with um, uh, Porter. Um, we're looking at the corporate strategy and saying how would the HR, what kind of HR activity are we thinking about? How would it differ in, um, you know, in the different types of strategic environments? For example, if the company's in growth mode, then it's going to uh, reward people, if you look at the compensation area, uh, reward people for market growth. You know, we want to develop an incentive system so that we're encouraged to grow the company and that the rewards are based on that market growth. Um, the training is going to be on development and helping the company to grow as quickly as possible. Performance appraisals is going to be uh, rewarding people and, anal and evaluating them based on their um, um, increases in market share. And the kinds of people you're going to hire at the managerial level are people who have a growth orientation um, versus a retrenchment mode, you know, just as a, as, a, as a real contrast, is you're going to hire people who have the capability of looking at a business and cutting out um, you know, bad areas and recognizing when things are not, when things are profitable and things are not profitable and knows how to retrench and shrink that company to make it more streamlined and more functional. Um, you know, so when it comes to compensation, if you're not growing and if you're not even stabilizing, you certainly aren't going to be, you know, have the extras to deal with fixed salary, you know, to deal with benefits and bonuses and things like that. So you're not going to have a variable pay system. You're going to have fixed salaries that may be frozen for a while until the company can stabilize, in which case then you can start to reward people for um, improvements in um, uh, functionality, improvements in efficiency, and or um, uh, growth, the beginnings of growth. Um, so you can see based on Gluck's typology that they're, you know, in the same, you know, set of four HR activities that there are different focuses for the HR activities, you know, hiring growers or hiring caretakers or hiring undertakers, depending on whether we're growing, stabilizing, or retrenching. And again, you do the same thing with differentiation strategy versus cost leadership. If you're a differentiation strategy company, you pay top dollar. You do you invest an enormous amount in training for innovation and quality service and, and customer service training. Um, your performance appraisals are going to be based on um, the risks that people take in terms of being more innovative versus a cost leadership company. They're much more focused on internal efficiency, so you're going to reward people based on efficiency. You might be more likely to have a gain sharing program versus a profit sharing program. So your gain sharing program is about making sure that we are being more productive and more cost efficient and effective in our in our in our uh, methods, um, you know we're going to reward people for managing and cutting costs, and we're not going to be paying a lot extra in variable pay and bonuses. We're simply going to be keeping you know salaries on the low end of the scale. So we can do the same activity, if you will, with you know any one of those strategic typologies that we were discussing.